Hey, buddy. Okay. I think we're live now. All right. Is that your phone with? No, that was her tablet. Something about a game. Oh, yeah, my game was. Oh, are we live on Facebook? Here. There we are. You're supposed to be. All right, here. I've got us. All right, JR, introduce us. Hey, guys, I'm JR Cochran. This is Wes Rose to your far right. And Mr. Todd Asher in the middle. He is a freshwater striper fishing expert. He used to be a guide. Come on, expert. Expert. We're going to talk fishing and pick your brain a little bit in this episode of Real Fishermen. So, how's it going, Todd? Doing great. How are you doing today? Good. <laughs> Wes, are you guys ready to go fishing at Chesapeake Bay here in a couple weeks? Oh, yeah. We're just waiting to get the word when the fish is going to be there. and Hope the weather works out for us. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of hard to find a window sometimes up there in the Chesapeake Bay. Can we do a test comment? I went, uh, I think we went twice last year, and me and Alan went, planned to stay for four days, and got to fish a day and a half of it, so. But you, you know, got you fun. Went. I remember uh, you went live on Facebook, and you guys were at a restaurant. I forget the name of the restaurant, but uh, Caleb Page and a bunch of guys were up there. That was at uh, Yuck Yuck and Joe's. Todd remembers that restaurant. You, you remember the Three Fingers Deep, Todd? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a hell of a night. But, yeah, uh, actually, that's the day Alan caught his fish. Um, that was that night. Um, yeah, we got to fish a day and a half out for a four-day trip. So, And I think one of those days we all went over to Norfolk, went bowling, and just rode around, went over to Ocean's East, the other tackle store over there in Norfolk, just kind of hung out. So if you go up there expecting for five days, expect hopefully to get If you fish two days, you're doing good. If you fish three days out of five, you're doing excellent. Yeah. So uh, are you going to take your boat up there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Todd, you going? Yeah. yeah, I'll be up there. Me and Max can go up for a few days, watch the weather, shoot up there, try to hit a good – you know, window. Yeah. Are you guys going to hop on uh, the Sea Ark or are you going to take your boat? No, I'm going to take my boat. I don't, you know, I'm in the heat in the cabin. Give me the cabin in the heat. Yeah. How does that Sea Ark do up there in the bay? Well, well I'm going to have a lot of friends fishing this year if we have a cold winter. Yeah. What's going on, PD and uh, Clinton Lassard's in here, Palmetto Cats, Chris Hovis. Chris mm -hmm. Hovis said uh, Cotton Field, whatever that means. Oh, man, we can't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to leave that alone. <laughs> uh, it's a good time up there. I mean, you know, aside from just the fishing, you know, you get five, ten guys up there hanging out just having a good time. I mean, we, I mean, the fish was just extra, you know. Yeah, just hanging out and yeah, we yeah, laugh. Man. Good time. My motto is when I go up there and do that, if if I catch, you know, if I go up there and let's say I, we fished four days and we only catch two fish, if both of those fish were over fifty pounds, then in my opinion, that was an epic trip. <laughs> yeah, best trips happen when you least expect it. So what are y'all uh, normally fish with when you go up there? I, I wasn't really planning on talking about the saltwater stripers, but we might as well since we're on the subject. So what are y'all fish? Y'all use eels or y'all trolling mojos, umbrella rigs? Like what are y'all using for bait up there? Uh, go ahead, uh, well, I got real, I got real familiar with eels last year. Um, you know, the first time I went up there, I went with peel. So I didn't really have to handle those eels too much. Um, but when me and Alan got on the boat together, he didn't know nothing about them, and I didn't know nothing about them, except they looked like a snake to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you, we did okay. It took us 
It took us about 30 or 45 minutes to get four eels on and actually get them out on fingerboards. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I don't guess that's too bad for, for one guy that's scared of them. Another guy didn't know nothing about them either. Um, how, but, we, how was the tide? How was the current up there? With uh, How much weight did you have to use to get those eels down? Well, I'm assuming you were trolling them. From last year, from what Chuck, you know, and Clint was telling us, you got you want to kind of stagger your weights. So, you know, I mean, on one, we might run a half ounce weight. On one, you might run a three quarter ounce weight. You know, one or two, you don't run no weight at all. And then, and you know, and like Chuck Tomlin, he's got this down. To, he fishes almost like a scientist. You know, he tries to calculate with his down. He, well, he says his down rod tells you everything. You learn how to read your down rod and what your bait's doing, how your bait's being presented in the water versus how fast you're going, if you're fishing with the tide or if you're having to fish crossways. Um, you know, it's funny you talk about tide. Me and Alan, you know, we were pulling boards up there right after he caught that big fish. And, you know, and all of a sudden I looked and Alan said, Wes, we're not going nowhere. And I said, yeah, we are. He said, but we're not moving. I said, the hell, we're not. Look at the boards. You know, they're spread out all uniform, all pretty, you know, four on each side. Floats out there, everything looks good. Well, about 30 minutes later, I look back at Alan. I said, buddy, we ain't going no damn way. And I didn't realize that the tide had changed. And the way we were going, the tide switched on us. And the trolling motor was on like three or four, and it was just enough to hold us still. Hmm. So we sat in the same, which Clint Lassar said, actually, that's a good thing. You know, I mean, the fish were around, you know, you liable to get hit right there. Uh, so, yeah, the big thing up there is tides, you know, knowing which way that tide's going, how fast it's going, how fast you want to pull your bait. To, freeze it. to me, from what I'm hearing up there, especially from Clint and Chuck both, it's, uh, and I guess Todd will tell you this, it's all in bait presentation, and it's really important up there with those eels. So. I'm a lost ball. I'm not leaving up there. I just list what everybody else does. Well, speaking of, with it. Switch, switching gears on to, that's a good segue on to, Freshwater, Todd. Um, I know when I went with uh, Hovis and Shane Reel and Daniel Skipper to Tennessee fishing, I'm not going to name any spots because I'm not trying to blow out Tennessee in this show. But when we went up there, we were using trout and skipjack, and we did have some gizzard shad. But on that trip, trout was the number one bait. That was the primary bait those guys wanted to use. They, they, definitely preferred the trout over the skipjack and um, i guess my question to you is uh do they prefer trout all the time speaking of the big stripers do they or does their preference in forage change due to seasonal patterns you know whether they're deep shallow winter fall spring summer you know do they switch do they switch up and and when they do switch up uh you know what is uh what is dic what is dictating the switch up is in other words touch on the transitional pattern too like when it, coming from winter to spring uh, what are those what are those big fish keying in on and why well as far as the you know start off with the bait thing I mean if I only had one bait to fish with for for big stripers the rest of my life it obviously did skip that are you getting that feedback with yeah, I can hear it. Does it sound okay? Yeah, I can hear you and Todd good. I get, I'm getting a little feedback on you, but not here. Y'all, uh, Wes, you got your volume turned all the way down on your volume turned down on there. That's yeah, the volume was, yeah, I've got the volume up on my phone on the tablet. It's completely down. Okay. Well, it sounds okay now. Okay, try okay. it again, Todd. But anyways, like I say, you know, in what type of base it was. It, it depends on if you're talking big fish, schooling fish, you know, party fish, we call it. As far as the big fish thing, I'd take a skipjack over anything, you know, throughout the year. Um, there are, and it depends, and, and where the trout come in depends on, you know, what reservoir you're fishing. Um, there are there are reservoirs where I'll take a trout over a skipjack, 10 to 1. Um, you know, just that's what's there, that's what they like to eat. Um, depending on how you're fishing, it's harder you know, if you're moving a lot, if you're moving with skipjacks, you know, throwing them back and forth in the tank, they're not going to stay as lively. You know, trout are more hardy, so if you're running up and down, up and down, and, you know, throwing out baits, I'll take trout, but as far as setting in a stationary spot, uh, skipjack all day. 
why they prefer them. I think it's just the vibration of the fish, you know, even like herring is your alewives, your bluebacks, the same deal. You know, they, they just really put off the vibration that attracts those fish. You know, I've caught big fish on uh, skipjack and they, you know, wouldn't touch anything else. I, I think they'll make an inactive fish active, you know, whether by the vibration of them being super lively, you know, can't get them to hit them alive, cut them, put them on the bottom, you know, whatever you may do. Are you more of a trolling guy? Well, you know, some people, they'll say, well, I'm a trolling guy or I'm an anchor guy or, you know, I'm a, a chunking guy, live bait guy. Or, or do you just let the fish dictate how you fish for them? Yeah, whatever they want that day. You know, I, I use – I don't pull a ton of planer boards. Um, I'll pull them, you know, if I'm, if I'm not on the fish, looking for the fish. And, and when I'm saying all this, this is all big fish stuff, not just party fish. But, you know, if I'm big fish fishing and looking for the fish, I'll pull boards, put a big spread out. Once I get a hit, all right, they're right here. Why are they there? Why are you close to creek mouth, drop off? What are they doing? Are they stacked there? Can I go over there and, you know, put down lines on top of them? Can I pitch them free line? You know, I'll, I'll catch a lot more fish a lot faster you know, with different techniques than pulling boards. I feel like pulling boards is a great way to locate them, you know, in these smaller rivers and reservoirs. But I'm not just going to, like, pull boards down, get a hit, go back up above them, put boards out, you know. I feel like, one, you know, it's kind of a – I use those to locate them more than anything. Right. I know or if I'm just, if or if just stuck boards. in that day, I'm just <laughs> spread out, hoping I'll get a bite. Some guys, if they're pulling boards and they, and they get a – they catch a fish – you know, especially on a reservoir, they'll they'll turn around and troll right back through them. But I guess when you're when you're targeting trophy fish on a on a river, it's a little different. Yeah, and even their reservoirs here in East Tennessee, you know, they're most of them are just controlled rivers. You know, there's a lot of current. You know, it's nothing like a you know big thirty forty thousand impoundment that's you know just still water. You know, everything here, you know, with the exception of Norris and Cherokee, was not any big fish there anymore. Um, you know, everything's moving. Oh, I'm sorry, Todd. JC Crowder's got a good question. Did you see that? Let's see if I can he see wants that. to know if you like circle hooks or octopus hooks. Um, I just fish straight octopus. Um, I'm, I never fish circle. I use uh, Gamagatsu octopus hooks. I'm not a fan of circle hooks at all. <laughs> Not saying they don't work, just my preference. I don't have faith in them. I a think lot of people uh, use them. Well, especially if you're fishing a lot of current. Uh, I noticed the guys that I went with, they didn't use circle hooks either. They used the big river, like a 10 aught big river gamakatsu. Beautiful hook, but uh, yeah, it's not a circle hook. And they set the hooks on the fish. Yeah. Well, if you're a jerker, if you like to jerk, do not use a circle hook. It is not your thing. And I'm a jerker. I'll jerk. I'll, I'll try to break his damn back. <laughs> hey, Wes. Uh, uh, let's see. I just had a good question. Kevin Blue, question for Wesley Rose. What's your opinion on fluorocarbon and list your reasons why? <laughs> hey, that's a loaded question. Uh, I don't like it for the strength of it. You know, people say the fish. I, uh, honestly, my opinion, I don't believe a fish is smarter than me. It may be. But I don't believe a fish can tell the difference between clear mono and a piece of fluorocarbon. Now, they say, I have heard that they say something about there's the way sunlight, especially if you're fishing in clear water when sunlight, the way sunlight goes through mono, it, mono intensifies the light versus fluorocarbon. It don't. I don't I've never got that scientific about it. Um, I've had people say they fish side by side with them. They get more bites on fluorocarbon. I'd have to see that to believe it. I just don't like the strength of it. Um, they just, say it, bro, it stretches less, and they say it's a little more abrasion resistant. I don't but know. The knot, I don't the like strength, you know, when you and when you knot it up, I think you weaken. If you got, say, so you got forty pound fluorocarbon, I don't care how much oil and spit you put on it. By the time you cinch that knot up, it's probably not twenty five pounds. I mean, it's, yeah. I just don't like it, but you know, it's whatever people like. If it makes you comfortable, it, like Randy Brown told me one time, 
you got to have confidence in what you're doing. You got to have confidence in where you're fishing. If you don't have confidence in it, you're probably not going to catch no fish. And I, I don't have confidence in fluorocarbon. A lot of people do. So there's your answer, Kevin. Do you spend the extra few dollars to get the fluorocarbon? Yeah, I definitely. I'll use fluorocarbon in clear water, especially. Um, you know, of course, it's murky and whatever. I don't care. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen times, you know, you get bit when you wouldn't, you know, if you didn't have it. What about braid? Uh, you, are you a braid user or are you stick with mono for your main line? I, I stick with mono. Um, I've, got, I use, I've got a few spinning rods now with braid, but I like mono. I mean, just always have. I like the uh, extra cushion it gives me, you know, when you're, when you're fighting a fish. Um, I like mono too. One of the biggest reasons I like mono is because I catfish mostly and I'm cut baiting on anchor. And whenever I'm anchored up cut baiting, my line is laying on the bottom, you know, and I don't want braid laying down there on the bottom where it can get cut up on rocks. Cause you know, rocks are a lot of other stuff, especially on Lake Wiley. There's a lot of crap down there that can just cut braid just real easily. Yeah. Hey Todd, Ron Russ, our buddy Ron Russ got a question for you. All right, what is Ron, Ron wants to know. He said this is a question for Todd. He said, "Are old Walmart rods and reels, mm -hmm. are old Walmart rod and reels really expensive?" LOL. Asking for a friend named Wesley Rowe. <laughs> hey, we, we use what we use. I don't know. I don't always have the most expensive tackle on the table. <laughs> So I guess that's another reason I use mono. I need some stretch to make up for that lack of drag I got. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Todd, do you look for when certain big, kinds of structure? Huh? Do you look for certain types of structure when you're fishing? Yeah, you know, the rivers and stuff. I'm, I'm concentrating on, on creek miles and, you know, drop-offs, eddies, bends in the river, you know, islands, you know, just all the normal stuff. Um if I'm going up a river in the spring for the first time and the fish aren't all the way up yet, honestly, the first thing I do is look for a blue herring on the, you know, I look for birds on the bank. I look for signs of life, you know, any kind of sign. I don't care what, you know, what river I'm on, you know, and, and a lot of my best spots, anytime there's a heron sitting there, boom, I know it's going about to be on. You know, there's a certain trees that these birds will sit in, you know, year after year. So I, I just try to, you know, more than the structure and stuff, especially in the river, depending on what it is. You know, of course, in the summer, they're all packed up at the top. and But when they're moving back and forth, I just try to find the most life, even on the, you know, even on the banks, not just in the water. Yeah. Those birds are a lot smarter than I am. You said that uh, skipjacks, you're probably the, your primary bait most of the year, except for the handful of spots that, that uh, have trout. So do you ever... Um, other than live and cut bait, do you ever throw uh, artificial lures? Oh, I love artificial. I take a, I take a fish on artificial over anything. You know, well, what, when the opportunity arises. What would, what would uh, be your favorite? What's your favorite lures? Oh, man. You know, it just depends on where we're at. I mean, the banjo, far, banjo menace. Banjo, banjo menace. menace. Um, I mean, you know, there's a million different lures out there, but, you know, early morning, fog on the water, on the river. I swear, man, just, just give me an old school red fin. It's hard to beat. Do you like the jointed back or the, the big red fin, the, the red, like the five inch? Or? Just, the, just the big red fin, not a jointed one. And then, okay. of course, you know, we'll do swim baits and all that stuff. And yeah. Alabama rigs are times of year. Alabama rigs in the winter when they're on peeing on small bait. That's a good What's one. up, Gary Padiz? Chris, Chris Hobus said we're breaking up. Are we still breaking up, Hobus? No, no. Lori said you were good. She's watching it on her phone. She says everything's coming in pretty clear on her. Yeah, he must be on that Waterloo wireless then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, speaking of Waterloo, Daniel Skipper's got a question. And he should know this as much as he fishes, but I'm going to answer it anyway or try to. He wants to know how far back do you run your bait behind the board? And do you use weight when you're pulling? It depends on how deep of water you're fishing. You know, which mostly in Tennessee, I, I don't fish too much over 10 foot deep of water, maybe sometimes 15, 20 at the most. But if I'm fishing real shallow water, 
you know, four or five foot water. I'm going to put my bait about what, Todd, five or six foot behind the board, maybe not even that much, just depending on how, you know, how deep you're fishing, I guess. And Just depending on the uh, structure around you. Yeah. I will say this. I learned this from, uh, and I mean, good Lord, I've fished with so many people over the years. You know, you pick up something from everybody, you know. When I started striking fishing in the late 90s for big fish, early 2000s, I was clueless. But uh, Mike Madalena, guy down in Georgia we used to fish with, super great striper guide. Yeah, uh, I've read some articles by him. We we fished a lot together when I was, you know, started started catching some big fish. And uh, he taught me the importance of a downline. And when I say a downline, you think 30, 40 feet deep. No, nah, I'm talking about a 10 foot river, an 8 foot river. Like, a down, I mean, those fish are laying on the bottom. They're not always going to be active enough to come up to the surface and eat a bait. But that downline, a lot of days, it'll, it'll save you. It'll get you a fish when nothing else does. Or a transom bait. Transom baits are killer. You know, just 8, 10 feet off your prop wash. You know, I've caught. Fish on that I caught one right off the prop wash when I went to Tennessee with Hovis and Real and uh and scan uh Kipper. That's Dude, where I, I, I ended up losing it, but it was a big fish. The transom bait is freaking unbelievable what it does and produces fish. You know, where, even if you're in 30 feet of water, it's crazy. You know, 30 feet or five feet of transom bait is killer. Yeah, it was on a little peanut, little uh gift jack about that big. Nice. Hey, Todd, here's a good question for you. Now, I've actually kind of wondered about this, too, sometimes. This is from Scott Perry. What's, what water temperature do you look for in the winter and early spring, and what temperature is, is too cold? It's never too cold. Um, I was down around uh, – I was down on Watts Bar one winter, January, February. Water was 42 degrees, and uh, – that was a crazy day because I had gizzards and trout, I think, with me. Fish blowing up everywhere. Pulled, you know, pulled the gizzards through. You know, I had four to, say, eight-inch gizzards. Pulled the gizzards through, wouldn't touch it. I'm talking fish breaking at the boat, just like an acre of them. Um, pulled the trout through, nothing, nothing, nothing. So I was like, man, I was like, we only got one option. We ran over to the steam plant, literally fished for probably an hour, caught two skipjacks. Went back to where the fish were breaking. They weren't in the water. Ten seconds, we were hooked up on a double. Mm. So they'll eat any time, just depending on what they eat, just trying to figure it out. What they want. That's it. What they want, what makes them thick that day. Kevin Blue says he enjoys this a whole lot better than cat, Catfish Weekly. And Ryan Ruff <laughs> just said, Alex, out Ryan, uh, Ryan wants to know, Todd, what's your preferred bait, L-Wise, L-Wise or Gizzard? Oh, L-Wise, a million to one. I, I say that, and, and, you know, it depends on the situation, but those l are frisky. But now, if your l aren't good, like I've done both, I've, I've taken, he's fished with me with l just go down there and just smoke the fish in the river, and then that night, me and you went and got them, Wes. I don't know what I did. I screwed them up. I put too many in there, probably. Went down there the next morning, caught three or four fish. You know, so you just, no you matter what. Night we were, that night we were catching them. All that bait we caught was bad the next morning? Heck, yeah, dude. It was sad. Because that was a beautiful thing. I just put too many in there. And which brings me okay. back to another point. This is from uh, – and, and a lot of these tips I'm giving you, it's just from stuff I learned over you know, the years. He's El Cox. I don't know if anybody knows Ezel on here, but he's a legend up here in East Tennessee. He's been fishing since the 70s for these things, and you learn a lot from that guy. Um, he once told me, he said, I'd rather have 10 good baits than 50 shitty baits, for lack of a better word. You know, so don't always try to stuff the tank with too many baits. You know, just put enough in there. I try to keep it at one bait per gallon, depending on the size. The wives, I'll do about two baits per gallon, depending on how big they are. Um because if you don't have if your bait's not top notch, I don't care if it's the best bait in the world. You know, it's going to be tough to catch fish even when there's a lot of active fish around you. Well, let me ask you this. This is a question for me. I guess I've asked you this before, but I'm going to ask you again. What's the deal with keeping skipjack alive? For anybody that wants to do that, I've tried it. You know, when I first bought that Mills tank last year, 
me, you, and Jason, we call what we catch 20 or 25 right there in about two or three hours. Yeah. And those, and, and we had, I had a little over half a tank of water and they were living at 1230 that night when I went to bed and I put my battery, Bo let me borrow a battery charger. I put the battery charger on it and it happened to be a bad battery charger and I didn't know it. And I got the wrong one and the bait died. But that bait lived in there for what? Six, seven, maybe eight hours before, you know, the aerator went out. And then yeah. I've, put, I've put 10 skipjacks in a 30 gallon tank and a 50 gallon tank before and going up the river and they'd roll over on their side and die in an hour. I've never had much success in anything less than a 75 gallon tank. Um, I fish with a hundred gallon water trough from tractor supply that's 60 bucks. Um, and it doesn't have to, you don't have to have a hundred gallons of water. That, don't get confused with that either. It's the, you know, it's the, the, the surface area for them to swim around. I can take that 100-gallon tank, fill it up 10 inches and keep fishing it just fine. They just need that rent room to swim. And, a you know, 50-gallon tank or less, you may keep them, you know, an hour or two, just depending on where you're catching them. The water quality has got a lot to do with that. You know, if you're catching them out of 80-degree water or 60-degree water, a million different things. But at the end of the day, get a big tank. Don't be super stressed about thinking I can't fit a hundred gallons of water in my boat. You don't need to. Just like I said, put ten inches in it and you can keep eight, ten skipjack. No problem. Um, I, used to, man, I built like when I moved from my last house. This is probably ten, fifteen years ago. I cleaned out and <laughs> Hovis was on, in on this. We tuna tubes, cow troughs. I mean, man, I built so many contraptions. And, you know, at that time, nobody was keeping them alive. Um, I, you know, 1100 gallon pumps thinking I had to have a river inside there, this, that, and other. And it turns out they just need the surface. Um, I, I ended up buying one of those black trough tanks of 100 gallons, kept them overnight for the first time, man. I, and, and that really changed everything for me catching big fish, being able to transport them, keep them overnight, and not just keep them, but I mean, like. They'll freaking take your planer board underwater when you hook them up in the morning. They're that light. Wow. You know, now that you say that, I remember me and Drew Rankin borrowed your boat. I think it was about two years ago, and you had that big 100-gallon tank on there, that, that black tank. Yeah. And we went over there and caught some bait. You know where we were because you finally showed up later. You were running about two hours late. But anyway, I remember we, we had about 15 or 20 jacks, and he put them in that tank, and he put a little old, just like an aerator, a little bubbler. Uh, yeah. 12 volt bubbler and I said damn bud I said listen you need to put some you ain't gonna put no air oxygen on them or nothing and he told me to shut up I didn't know how to keep Skip Jacks alive he didn't know what he was doing hey, and well, hey that's, that's, who, and that, yeah, that's, who, that's who taught me about just using the 12 volt bubbler was uh, ranking I mean you know I always had a pump in mine I thought you had to have pump and some current but yeah. man he you know, he, he transported a whole lot of skipjack and, and kept them alive. And I was like, dude, just with a freaking aerator, basically a little, you know, a little stone blowing air. You know, back in the day, I had pure oxygen and I had this and I had that, you know, just everything in the world. And just space and the, the black tank of those uh, troughs helped too. What I was going to ask you, do you think the color has anything to do with it? It Why? Absolutely. I mean, like, I kind of figured it out on accident, you know, using that cow trough back in the day. And then uh, I moved back up to Kentucky for a few years, worked at a car lot, you know, when I quit guiding and stuff, and I came back. And uh, me and Billy always fished together, Billy Davidson, and he's like, man, he's like, you know how those things live so good. I was like, well, he's like, the, he's like the black walls in there, you know, whatever. And so, of course, everybody knows now, but, you know, back 10, 15 years ago, nobody was keeping them alive more than a couple, two or three hours. I mean, I knew guys over in middle Tennessee, they would take, uh, I mean, they had like freaking a trailer that they would put, Hovis might know, I mean, they'd do like a thousand gallon tank on this trailer that they would catch their jacks, throw them in there. And that's how they kept them alive to fish in different parts of the rivers. You know, they would take a separate vehicle. But, you know, once, once you figure that out, that changed the whole game because, you know, <laughs> keeping those things alive and having them when the fish were feeding was. was so I wonder the surface area. I wonder if, um, like, you know, the, the other bait fish, your gizzard shad, you know, your owl wives, your, your thread fins. Or I think the difference. 
I think that here I'll answer this before. I mean, it may not be what you're asking, but the skipjack herring, you know, they're a, they're a, they're a large fish, you know, and they're a pelagic fish. They're not a fish that just sits there like a, a gizzard just sitting on the bottom right. sucking algae. Yeah, you know, stay moving. Yeah, they stay moving, man. I mean, like I've seen schools of them in shallow water, man. They, they I mean, they're. A, they're like a saltwater fish. They're in the salt. I was about water. to say, but these bait these bait tank businesses and companies were about to go out of business if that wasn't the case. <laughs> yeah. So the, the I think I think those big skipjack, you know, they just constantly have to be moving and just need space. I mean, and like I said, you know, sometimes I'll throw ten in that tank and, and keep them freaking awesome. And then depending on what lake I'm, you know, what the water quality is, you may throw ten in there and half of them die. You know, when when you got everything right, it just depends on. Um, eight, and like, if I catch them in eighty degree water, um, I'll throw probably about sixty pounds of ice in my tank before I get to the lake. So I'll chill that water like ice water before I put them in there. Because if you put them in eighty degree water, good luck. Do you think that the uh, chlorinated ice makes a difference? Or yeah, I use chlorinated ice. I use it all the time. Um, a guy at the trout farm I get trout from, he said that frozen water actually holds more oxygen in it as it thaws. So, I mean, I never have any problem with chlorine at all. Uh, okay. I don't use any kind of dechlorinator. I'll change my water right out here with city water out of my water hose. I just spray it, you know, like a in between a mist and a stream and the chlorine will evap evaporate in the process. Okay. Hey, hey, Todd, Scott Perry's got a question. And uh, listen, uh, I'd probably like to know this too. Have you got any secret spots left? <laughs> I got one or remember, two. Remember, remember, if your air condition breaks down or your heat breaks down, <laughs> why? I didn't think about that. Yeah, Scott, if, if it's heat and air breaks, I'll let you know. <laughs> I got a few, Scott. <laughs> Clinton Lassard said saltwater plus fluoro plus eel plus circle plus patience equals stud rockfish. Fact. Fact. Yeah. I agree with him. And, you know, when we went to New York last week or a couple weeks ago, you know, they have to use circle hooks up there. And like I said, man, hey, they work great. We hook fish and they stayed hooked. Um, I think what I don't like about the circle, I guess it depends on the application and what you're doing. If I'm using a big skipjack and I'm hooking you up behind the head like I do, I have a real problem with that that circle hook coming out of there and getting his lip. Um, and it just may be me. I mean, some people may use them and have a 100% success rate. But like Wes said earlier, you know, have faith in what you do. And, and you know, I have I just don't have faith in it. So back to the bait tank. So if a man was going to buy a uh, one of these, uh, these, these bait tanks, you know, your Shad Shacks, your Super Bait Tanks, your Males, if they were going to buy one of those and they were a trophy striper fisherman that liked to use skipjack, so they should probably get a hundred gallon one, right? To give those. Yeah, if you're going to be serious. Theory. I mean, if you're going to be serious about keeping skipjack, I'd get the biggest thing that your boat can handle. Black line. Is a, black line. A black line, hundred gallon. I would. I mean, that's what I would do. I mean, the the, the white ones, the hundred gallons, people keep them in those good too. I just got a lot of faith in the white personally. Um, yeah. You know, I, I wonder if the dark blue would work too. I think there was some bait tank company way back um, had a blue line in there. I can't remember who it was. Uh, Ron Vest. Nah, somebody else. Like I can't. Remember. Hey, why Clint's on here? Uh. I made a post the other night, and I'm still trying to figure out why people say saltwater, big saltwater fish don't count. Because they're not going to catch, how to catch them. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I believe it is. I mean, listen, if you can catch, I mean, you're fishing in the ocean. We're fishing in a freaking river that's 50 yards wide. Surely to God, we can catch them. Yeah. But people, then people say, well, you've got, there's more fish in the ocean. But there again, like, for instance, we're fishing in a Chesapeake Bay. If I'm not mistaken, it's about 450,000 square acres of water. That probably would make up river. every river, lake, and whatever in Tennessee and Kentucky combined. You'd probably still fall short. 
Yeah, yeah. Chesapeake Bay is huge. Huge. Well, oh, uh, Kevin Blue wanted to know why when uh, you was going to invite Jim Lee Durham on on the show, Jr. I don't know that, who that is. That I'll have anybody on hey, here. That would be a good one. Get him and Brian Bear on here at the same time. So, what's your favorite out. size hook, Todd? You know, smallest I can get away with with the bait that okay. doesn't interrupt the. Uh, activity of the bait i mean when i when i'm fishing um when i'm fishing like uh people look at me like i'm crazy i'll be fishing you know six seven inch herring, eight inch herring, and i'm using a one-off hook catching 20 you know average fish you're catching are 15 to 20 pounds but we'll pop them over 30 here and there you know with a one-off hook i mean i went tuna fishing in venice and they use six off eight off hooks and we're catching 200 pound tuna i mean so it's you know the the smallest bait I, or the smallest hook i can get away with it doesn't you know interfere with the act, action of the bait yeah yeah you don't want a big 10 odd in a in a six inch herring you know weighing yeah. its numbers down hey todd daniel rush you got a question for you he wants to know seriously what your opinion is on abu garcia i got a lot of them in my uh Toolbox downstairs with the gut tripped out of. <laughs> now that's sixty five hundred. So I've never, I, I never fished with the seven thousands. You can do what you want to set. Like, listen, ninety percent of the time when I was like hitting this crap hard and super cracked out and obsessed with it, I was using a pin three ten GT plastic reel. So I'm not going. Now these reels that you're talking about with the gut tripped out of them. Are they the old felt drag ambassadors? Did you buy them at a pawn shop or did you no, buy those, them brand new? Those dark blue ones. What were those dark blue ones that's supposed did to be? Did you buy them? Or 5,000. Are they the thumb bar release or the push button? No, the, the 6,500. I can't remember. But, anyways, I caught a 42 pounder on it. Same kind of deal that you're talking about. A little tiny trout on a transom rod. Well, he smoked that. <laughs> I kept it, though. It was I'm going to have to learn the hard way, I guess. And, like I said, you can catch fish on anything. I mean, when I was, man, I was so broke all the time when I was guiding. I, I mean, I, like I said, I was using fifty dollar pin reels, and we caught fish. Whatever you know, yeah, those, old guy. Pins, those old pins are tanks, the old black yeah. ones, and the old senator. Yeah, yeah these were the last. Oh, go ahead, Todd. Nothing. I, I use some mono Dakotas now. That's my. That's what probably my go to reel now. And I've yeah. kind of got into the spinning reels too. I got some BG four thousand Daiwas and stuff like that. Yeah, man, black and gold. Yeah, that's, I think that's probably really. the best value spinning reel out there. Yeah, I think the worst rod on the market is a cold water Okuma. Man, yeah, I've heard a lot of bad stuff about them. Now the low profile ones seem to be better, but the round ones, you know, with the line counters, my yeah. dad guys now who took over the guide business for me. You know, back seven, eight years ago when I quit. But man, he bought like 10 of those suckers. They didn't last six months. And we're talking about Cherokee Norse fish, nothing over 15 pounds, 20 pounds. Wow. wow. Come on, Akuma. Get your now, I do have some Akuma spinning reels. They've lasted forever, but those cold yeah. waters. Akuma makes some good reels, but yeah, the cold waters, I don't think they're very good. I when think I uh, Tennessee, I went with Todd, that's a guy. Years ago, and yeah, you're right, Scott. I, I, I had had bought, ones. I'm sorry. I had bought, oh, you fine. I had six Pro Rocket Black Edition Abu 6500s, and I think that they were like 220 bucks at the time. And uh, you know, and and and, and man, Anthony Finn were up on the boat, and I'm talking shit, and I'm telling Todd this. I said, well, I've heard about how big these fish are up here, and he said, but well, I got something for their ass if I hit one of these. You know, and I had the white big cat fever, medium heavy rod, 30 pound Berkeley big game line. I just thought I was, yeah, I was up there strutting like a damn chicken. Well, we pull up to the down the cut bait and we throw the rods out and my rod went off first. And when it went off, I went back there and set the hook and I got the rod out of the rod holder. Hang on one second, Wes. Do you hear that, Todd? Mm -hmm. Is it messing? Is y'all's audio messing up? No, mine's not. I can hear both of y'all. 
Is your audio good, Wes? Mine is. Okay, it must just be me then. Okay. Go ahead, continue. All right. So I proceed to fight this fish while I get it out of the holder, and this fish is just smoking drag. So I tighten the drag down, and it's still just a steady run of drag. So Angie said, lock it down. So I locked it down. I could not get the drag to go no tighter. And this thing's still just smoking drag. And it got about, I could see the, I could see the spool where you spool it in the line pop. And that reel, when I went to reel it up, what little bit of line was left on it where it popped, it just sounded like garbage. And Todd's my witness. You can ask Anthony Finley. He's jumping up down holler, thumb it, thumb it, thumb it. You got to stop it. I'm not thumbing a down thing. I'm not burning my thumb over no fish. I just let it go. So needless to say, I came out to South Carolina, and them other five reels went on the market for sale, and I've never bought another Abu Garcia reel. Um, hey, I will say this about Abu. Tim Adrian, one of the greatest big striper fishermen you know, around here, he used seven thousands all the time, and that fool caught a lot of big fish. So... But you know, a, big striper, a big striper does run hard, you know, and that the level wine, I mean, I guess it could be some a good bit of wear on that level wine. And the, the drags in them aren't big. They're just a small, they got a small main main gear that uh, that drag presses against. So the drag is, is, the drag stack is small. And, you know, it's not really meant for uh, a fish that, that takes off with the speed that a trophy striper takes off on. But. As far as uh, catfish go, they work out great for me. You know, a catfish doesn't peel drag as fast as a striper. I'm not saying that that they don't fight as hard as a striper. They just don't have that initial run that a striper has. And uh, the, what I like most about the Ambassador 6500 C3s are the casting ability. I mean, I can just – I can cast them so, so well. And I just – they just feel at home on my boat. Yeah. So, Todd, what's the best time of year to catch big fish? All year long, depending on when they're eating. <laughs> Everybody has that. When's the best time? When's the best time? Well, best time could have been yesterday, but they stuck. You know, you can catch big fish all year long. Um, you know, everybody, you know, always thinks April, whatever, when they're doing the spawn thing. But, you know, if you've got a cold water reservoir where those fish aren't stressed at all throughout the summer, they're going to stay super fat. Obviously, probably the springtime is the best shot at a, you know, monster, monster trophy. But, you know, we've caught 50 plus pound fish every month of the year. Do those fish pretty much do the same thing in the fall up there in Tennessee as they do the spring? Do they have a false run? They have a false run up the natural rivers. You know, um, it, you know, every, every reservoir is different. I mean, you take Melton Hill Lake, you know, that water coming out of Norris ice water in the spring like 50 degrees 52 and it stays 52 through you know through summer so your fish don't really run up there in the spring you'll have a few go but most of them will find a, a creek that warms up super fast and spawn down you know not in the creek but downstream from it where that warm water that makes sense. See, that, that's one of the things that confused me about Tennessee is what you just said because around here we don't have any uh, cold water coming through like that yeah I mean you know, that, that, that that's what, I mean, you know, that's the difference, you know, but most of them, you know, if it's a natural river, of course, they'll go up in the spring and in the fall and they'll come back down after the spring, you know, but like our Melton Hill, Fort Loud and all the other dams that, um, you know, keep a decent temperature. They, uh, you know, Melton Hill stays cooler. They'll stay up there all summer long, of course, you know, where in the natural river, they'll get up in the 80s and they'll come back out um, and then go back up in the fall. Now, I've always heard that if you're after big fish, you know, you can go up and be a concrete cowboy up at the and fish the tail race, the boils. Hey, leave my buddy Doug Cole out of this. If you want, if you want a big fish, I've heard that you should go on down the river because they, uh, even though as, as much dissolved oxygen is up there coming out of the dam at, in the boils, you'd think it would just be loaded with, with dissolved oxygen. But I, uh, I heard that it's not as loaded with dissolved oxygen as you would think because the water is being pulled from the bottom of the lake above it, you know, and it, that water column is actually oxygen deprived. So that if, if you want a bigger fish, you need to go on down the river a couple, a couple miles, maybe. 
Is there any truth to that? Nah, I, you know, I, I've seen 50 pound fish caught at stands. You know, I've seen them caught downstream. So, spring only or any time of the year, like in the summer? Depends on the dance. <laughs> hey, Clint Lassard's got a question, and I love this question. Even those cold water dams. He won't, okay. Hey, Todd. Clint wants to know do we use VHF radios up here when we're fishing? And my first thought was, hell no, we got Jeff Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you got the truth. Um, I, I know a group of guys on on a couple lakes that use them, not not kind of the trophy waters, but Norse and Cherokee. You got some places that you don't have a lot of good reception, so you know guys will communicate on them. But as a whole, probably less than one percent. I'll tell you what I have. What I did notice, and this is a fact. You know, back home or here where we fish, you know, a lot of people are territorial, um, and we're you know, and I'm I used to be bad about it. I'm not as much no more. Everybody's got spots, you know, how I, I did my little thing trying to pat myself on the back a couple of years ago and blew up one of the best fisheries up there, which I, I still regret that to this day because I knew better and I did it anyway. But, you know, everybody's, you know, like Hova said, there ain't no such thing as spots on these waters. They, it, it might be your spot while you're there. And once you leave, it's not your spot no more. And the biggest secret in striper fishing or really any fishing is where they're biting at that particular second when you're catching them. Hey, listen, I, I always say this. I don't want to report. I want to be the report. That's right. Because after you hear it, after you hear it's it, it's already over. over. Yeah. yeah. You got to strike when the iron's hot. Yeah. And, you know, and up there I have noticed, like, you know, we use radios and stuff, but um, every time somebody would say fish on the radio, they would give, they'd tell you pretty much where they were, what buoy or what area they're in. And it's almost like everybody up there that I met, you know, like Clinton Kenny and and especially Chuck Timon, uh, you know, and even Jeff Peel. Jeff Peel helped me a lot while we were up there. You know, it, it's more up there. It's more like helping people because they want to see people catch fish and try to, you know, send somebody on a wild goose chase and saying, hey, go down here around Marker. I called it down here at Marker 40, such and such. And they ain't been around that Marker all day. You know, it's more that they're more willing to help you up there. You know, like when me and Shane went out with Clint, you know, and I told Clint, I said, but I said, you know, I'll probably bring my boat back up here. I just, I want to learn what you're doing. He didn't have no problem with that. He showed me everything they were doing, how they were doing it. You know, um, like, like Skipper was talking about how far they're pulling the bait behind, you know, how to stagger your bait, you know, running baits, different depths. Uh, Chuck Timon, he, he told me, he, me and Todd learned a lot from him up in New York. You know, so there's it's almost like a difference in, I guess, just where you're fishing at and the people you're around. Um, it's not as bad here as it used to be two years ago, but, you know, then again, you got people like Jim Durham. You know, he thinks he owns the whole Cumberland River. So you better be on your P's and Q's up there. Or he will put the police on you. You know, you said just, you weren't going to do this, Wes. Huh? You said you weren't going to do this. What I do? What you're doing right now. <laughs> Do you guys listen to any uh like podcasts? Or do y'all read? Do y'all I ain't got read an answer what you're talking about, bud. But I got a, I mean, a man, books, it. I mean, just open the door. Everybody start saying stuff. Do y'all have any like YouTube channels? Any any type of media that y'all consume uh, about striper fishing? Any what? Y'all have any media that y'all consume about striper fishing? Like podcasts, YouTube channels, you know, books, uh, online articles, or. <laughs> Um, I'm lazy now, so not as much. But like you know, like me talking about fishing now and all this stuff. I'm talking, you know, this is me five, ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Now, man, my kid, you know, he he's falling in love with fishing. My my son, my daughter. So now, when we go, I may just go out there and catch skipjacks all day. You know, just have a good time with them. I'm not as hardcore about it as I used to be, so I don't follow all the you know, social media and stuff. When I was coming up, the only thing I had was a, a website called Seeing Stripes, ran by Sean McNew. And, uh, you know, just a group of guys like us, you know, there wasn't any internet then, so we just had a little group to get together and share tips and tricks and techniques and stuff like that, you know, so yeah. anymore, um, I don't follow a whole lot. Yeah. How many boards do you feel comfortable pulling? Wes, how many are you going to pull? 
Uh, it depends on where I'm at. Up there, I'm probably going to pull about eight, but back home here, I'll pull about one on each side and one on a float. It depends on my bait. If I got big yep. skipjacks that are hard to control, I'll put one out each side, you know, just because if you start getting any more than that, it's hard to keep them out of each other. Then you end up fighting your bait more than you do presenting the bait where it needs to be. So I guess that dictates it more than anything. Thanks, Todd. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to keep up with these questions here. Uh, Travis Pace wants to know when you're cut baiting, you know, be trout or skipjack, or whatever. What? How do you like to hook your bait when you when you're cut baiting? Um, I, obviously, I like to use the head of the bait the best. Um, I'll hook it like where I cut it. I'll hook the guts. I like to get some of the guts on my hook and then go out the bottom of the belly. Not too deep because I want that hook to come out. I put the guts just to you know help keep them in there. Yeah. Um, I hate the mid sections of skipjack because they got a freaking hole out each side of the belly. It's like their guts are shoot out of it. If anybody's mm. got a tip on keeping those in, let me know. <laughs> but pantyhose. <laughs> no. heard. And I'm not the you know I I heard about a lot of cut baiting from. Uh, friend of mine over in Middle Tennessee, Don Slacker, and, you know, he'd tell me stories about these guys from North and South Carolina that just, I mean, that's all they do is cut bait. He used to fish an old striper <laughs> trail back in the early 90s, and, you know, that's kind of where I started hearing about it, and I said, man, cut bait, that's crazy, and, of course, we've had some success with it, but I'm definitely a novice when it comes to cut bait compared to some of these guys. How'd that cut bait work for you, Wes? So there you go. I thought we were going to leave that alone. <laughs> no, I tell you, you showed me, like I said, I, you know, you just showed me some stuff up there that just blew my mind. And I came back home because I, you know, like I said, a lot of people down here will help you. Some people won't. They're real secretive. Listen, the first time I fished Lake Russell, I asked some questions about Russell one time and I pulled planter boards till the damn paint fell off of them and couldn't get a bite. You know, I didn't, you know, a lot of this stuff I did learn on my own, but I really had a lot of help. You know, I have much respect for you and what you showed me because it's something I love to do. And that's why now, you know, I really, I've kind of got like you too. When I got people on the boat, you know, I like to watch other people catch fish. I loved Alan. Alan caught his personal best on my boat. Travis Pace caught his personal best on my boat. Anthony Finley caught his personal best on my boat. I'm not saying that, to, you know, to pat myself on the shoulder. I got to watch people catch big fish really from what you showed me, you know, from what Patrick Miller, I learned a lot from Patrick Miller. I've learned a lot from Scott Perry, learned a lot from Michael Walker, um, you know, and, and it's just, just so much knowledge and you get in with the right people, you know, eventually you'll start catching fish. But the biggest thing is, and I learned just a hard way too. stay off Facebook, get on the water, just find somebody that you know that catches fish that you can trust and get information from them. Cause you know, people say, well, you know, Todd Asher says this, or Billy Davis helps you do this, or such and such helps you do this. I think Todd you know, is one of the best have help for fishermen around me. Huh? I said, I think Todd is, you're the one of the most famous striper fishermen around. I, I think your name, I've probably heard your name about more than just about anybody's, and, and, and I've been hearing it for years, you know, even when I, not long after I first started striper fishing back you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, I was hearing your name back then. Well, I dropped for fish years ago, and then, of course, I got out of it. But, you know, then I went at it, you know, kind of like hard, just like Tom was talking about years ago. He went at it hard, um, you know, and, and there's a big thing. Um, everybody picks at me now, and Todd does too. Todd likes to be on the water, you know, when the damn sun's coming up. I'm not that mad at a fish no more. I'm not out there trying to wake a 50-pound fish up. Let him sleep. Listen, he'll be there when he, you know, he'll be there when I get there. And if he's not, he's not. Um, you know, I don't go at it that hard no more. But, you know, I mean, I, me and Todd became friends. I hired him years ago as a guide. And for whatever reason, he, you know, he still puts up with me. You know, he just, he, he just showed me so, he gave me so much knowledge. You know, Chuck Tymon that gave me and Todd so much knowledge. We had, listen, we hadn't even talked about this, but, you know, we were in that tournament up there. And you're talking about a buzzer winner. You know, Todd's son holds Maddox 11. Yeah, he's 11. 11-year-old 11 kid, a rod goes off, and we've got, I think, 
give or take 16, 17 minutes till 12 o'clock. And the way that tournament was, we had to take the fish, put them on a board, take the picture, and it had to be sent in an email. And it, and it didn't work where if you hooked up before 12 o'clock, you could fight the fish after. The last email you had till 12 at lunchtime. And if an email wasn't sent, it, it did not. That's when the, that was the cutoff. Long story short, his son got us a 52 pound fish. We weighed the fish on both the 52 pound. What was the Todd? 47 inches, 48, 47 47 inches. 47 inches up to the fork of the tail. So it's right about a 50 inch fish over all length. Wow. And that's what won us the tournament. And the timestamp on the email, they received the email 11.57. And oh, this wow. kid was like so stoked, dude. That was like the most amazing thing to watch. 11-year-old kid, and we won that tournament in New York. I mean, how more epic. That's probably one of the best fishing. That is, that's the best fishing trip I've ever been on in my life, watching somebody else do that. And a kid at that. I mean, he just, and listen. This, Maddox never complained. He never said, Daddy, I want to go back to the motel room. Daddy, I'm tired. Daddy, I'm hungry. Daddy, I'm sleepy. Daddy, I'm bored. You never heard none. There you go, right there. <laughs> Everybody can see that picture. Look at it. That's the fish Maddox caught that won us the tournament. You're talking about a proud papa, man. I was pumped. Can you sit on there, buddy? Yeah. Awesome. Oh, sure. You know, when Wes uh, asked me to start this show, which was only the night before last, I think, he called me and he said, hey, Jay, let's start a podcast. And I, and I said, well, I really don't know how to start a podcast. And I said, I can look into how to do what we used to do on Catfish Weekly, which was uh, use StreamYard to go live. So that's what I did. And I told him, I was like, well, we can just turn this into a podcast later. You know, we could just convert it to uh, audio and, and, and put it on all the, the podcasts. Uh, formats or uh, socials or whatever. But uh, when he said that our first guest, he wanted our first guest to be Todd Asher, I, I was honored. I thought, wow, that that's pretty good to to start a show in the very first episode you get Todd on there. So I was pretty happy about that. And he's got some uh, some more juggernauts lined up for us too. So I'm pretty excited about that as well. Don't blow me hey. up too much now. Hey, Todd, uh, Clint Lassard said to tell you he's really looking forward to meeting you this year in Cape Charles. That'd be awesome. I mean, you know, for all, all the fishing I did over the years, you know, there's a hundred people behind that that taught me some, you know, taught me everything. And I think if you, you know, the biggest thing about this, you know, and anything you do in life is just always continue to learn. You know, like even at this point right now, as much as I've fished, I feel like I know like that much about them. And I'm always, I mean, you know, listen to the guy fishing on the bank. He's going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind. And change everything that you thought you knew. You know, you're gonna learn something from everyone you meet, aren't you? Just be humble, listen, learn, and I mean, it's just awesome, man. I mean, I've met so many awesome people through fishing; it's just insane. That's what keeps us coming back. You know, none of us swim with them. So, well, there's a little, there's a little story. I'm not gonna tell this whole story, but some striper fishermen. Everybody knows. Some people know this story. Some people don't. But some striper fishermen. Got got a clue from a bunch of crappy fishermen. Some crappy fishermen told some striper fishermen where some fish was, and this coming from people catching crappy, and wound hey. up finding some awesome fish up there. Because just like Todd said, you know, it, it's just about being humble sometimes. Just you'll be surprised what people will tell you that'll blow your mind if you ever had a clue. Hey, I'll give you, I'll give everybody a secret. If you want to get, you know, whatever lake you're striper fishing, what do bass guys think about striper? Most of them hate. It. All right, so just go every Saturday morning. They're having a big tournament. Just go down to weigh in. Hey, ooh, ooh, anybody catch a striper today? I'm, I'm going to eat some. Hey, you're going to find out more information than any striper fisher will yeah, ever get good to advice. you. That's good advice. I know my, my bass fishing friends, they'll definitely tell you where the stripers are. I've they learned more them. from bass guys, you know, they're like, oh, man, I hooked one over at such and such. I'm like, really? You know, I'm thinking in my head, man, I what are they doing over there? And you start putting it all together, go check it out. You know, the next thing you know, you got to another good spot. I wonder if trout fishermen are the same way, like in Tennessee. Oh, they, yeah. they hate them here. Yes. They, uh, get on, we get on trout the trout trout page and see what they'll tell you. You get some good information from trout. Uh, well, Wes, it's been an hour. 
I told you it would go by fast. Yeah. Well, well, you want to call it? Well, we call it y'all. Who are we having on the show next, Wes? Uh, Who's next? Think this, this coming Thursday, we're going to have Clint Lassard and his first mate, uh, Kenny Mills. Um, I met those um, I actually last year. You know, I was thinking about going to Chesapeake Bay, and then I, you know, I said, "Well, I'm just gonna hire a guy, you know, go up there and see what's going on." And you know, and I've seen some pictures. He, some guys was holding up some pictures of some just huge fish, and I said, "Shit, that's who I want." So I called him and booked the trip. Me and Shane Howington went up there, and that's how we met Clint and Kenny. Um, all, also, awesome fishermen. Both of these guys, they really work hard. Um, I think Shane's booked with them again. Uh, Richard Skirt went out with them last year, I think, and somebody else called me about them, and I gave them, a, you know, I gave them Clint's dump, you know, information. But these guys really work hard, to, you know, just like Todd does. They'll work hard to put you on fish. They don't go out there and just put a bait in the water, you know, and cross their fingers. They're, they're really trying to put you on fish. Uh, but you know that, you know, we went Covey fishing with them. Also, made epic trip. Uh, you know, they just, he works hard. Um, you're looking for a guide up there. That's who I definitely, you know, a striper guide. Anybody's want to go up there this year. But if you want to try it, get with Clint Lassard. He's friends. On, um, he's on my page. He's on JR's page. And I'm not sure if Todd's friends with him yet or not. But it's Thank show enough. It's S H O N U F. Am I saying that right, JR? Show enough. Guy right, service. S H O N U F F. I think. Or it might yeah. just be one F. It's show enough sport fishing. Chesapeake Bay. Clint Lassard is on my Facebook. So. And another guide is uh, Todd's dad. He took over his guide service, and yeah. it's called Shad Nasty. So if you want a, a guide in Tennessee, look up Shad Nasty. Me and my wife went out with Todd's dad last year too, um, and it was. And he told us it was going to be a tough day. It was rainy. Um, it wasn't real cold, you know. It, it was it was cold weather, uh, and he found a fish for us. I think we wound up catching about eight or nine fish. Lori caught one about. 22, 23 pounds, and she was just ecstatic. Um, and Joe's another one. He works real hard. He's real serious. When he gets on that water, if there's a fish in there and it'll bite, he will find it for you. That's a fact. So Todd got Todd got his honestly. You know, he learned. He, he had a good teacher. Joe's Todd, a great. Thank guy. you so much for joining us tonight. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks for having. Me. I guess we'll call it. Have a, have a good night, guys, and we'll see you on the next episode of Real Fishermen. See you. See you. Good night. Everybody have a good night. Thank you, John. Thank you, JR.